Well, hello, good morning, and welcome once again to our midweek Bible studies in the Gospel of John. Today we're going to be in uh, John chapter 16, so do take this opportunity to grab a Bible and have John 16 open. Now, uh, we are, of course, back with Jesus and those first disciples. We're back in the upper room uh, and it's the night of Jesus' betrayal and arrest. And he's been talking with his disciples about his departure, about going away, his literally his exodus. He's been talking of returning to the Father. But of course that return to the Father is via uh, the suffering and death of the cross. And Jesus, as he talks with them, is preparing them for what will come next. If you remember, going back to chapter 14, he's reassured them that they will not be alone, that he will not leave them as orphans, but that another like him, remember the word paraclete, another like him, called alongside them, the counsellor, the advocate, the spirit of truth, will come to them. And all that Jesus was to them, all that Jesus will achieve for them when he dies on the cross, will be theirs through the Spirit who will come alongside. But if Jesus began by talking words of reassurance, he's now begun to talk about the mission on which he will send his disciples. In a way, it's summed up right at the end of John's Gospel in these words, John chapter 20 and verse 21. Jesus says to them, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. In other words, while he returns to the Father, he sends them into the world. Uh, and as we've seen, uh, he sends them into the world to bear fruit. That was chapter 15 and verse 16. To be effective, to be fruitful followers, fruitful disciples in the world. But we also saw Jesus remind them that if they are to bear fruit, they will only do that as they remain united to Jesus. United to him and united to his word. That was chapter 15 and verses 5 and 6. And we had that wonderful picture of Jesus as the true vine and us as the branches. In other words, they will only prove effective in mission as they remain in him, obeying his commands and loving one another. But then he goes on to warn them of the cost of this mission. That begins in chapter 15 and verse 18. He speaks to them of the opposition that they will face, warning them that the world will hate them just as the world has hated him. And then from chapter 16 and verse 5, which is what we're going to be looking at today, he tells them again of the resources available to them for their mission, specifically for that mission. So literally, I have sent you, he says, go into the world, be my distinct and holy, obedient, loving people, fruitful people. Go into the world and speak and live for me. The world will hate you for it, just as they hated me. But look at who will be alongside you. And again, he's talking about the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit who will come to equip them to fulfil the mission that Jesus has given them. So we're going to have a look at that in particular. Uh, the spirit of truth equipping us for the mission to which Jesus entrusts us. So uh, have a look at chapter 16 and verses 5 to 16. I'm going to read it and then I'll pray and then we'll have a look at the passage uh, chapter 16 and uh, verse 5. Jesus says, Now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you asks me, where are you going? Because I have said these things, you are filled with grief, but I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. 
Unless I go away, the counsellor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and will tell you what is to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take what is mine and make it known to you. And in a little while you will see me no more. Then after a little while you will see me. Well, let me pray for us as we look together at God's word. Father, we thank you for these words of our Lord Jesus as he prepares his followers for their mission in the world. Help us to hear him and to respond with glad, obedient and loving hearts. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we look at this section, let me uh, tackle it, in a sense, by asking some questions. And here's the first question. How will the mission of Jesus be accomplished? Or if you like, put it another way, how will the people of Hailsham be persuaded about Jesus? Have a look with me at verses uh, uh, 5 to 7. And what Jesus says here is really strange. He talks about going away, verse 5. And he recognises, verse 6, that they will all be filled with grief because of that. He recognises they are confused and grieving and frightened. But then he says something really strange, verse 7. But I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counsellor will not come to you. Now, of all the things that Jesus says, isn't that the strangest? It's better that I go away, he says. And you think, well, how can that possibly be the case? He's asking them to swap life with Jesus alongside them for, apparently, life on their own. And, and you wonder, how can that possibly be better? Especially when it comes to living for Jesus and reaching out to the world with the good news of Jesus. I mean, think about it. Uh, what would you, if you were putting together a strategy to persuade the people of Hailsham of the wonder of Jesus? I wonder what your strategy would be. What would be the best possible plan of action? And you probably think, well, that's obvious. It would be obvious, wouldn't it, if, if Jesus came uh, and if Jesus was there on Vicarage Field. That would be a, a fantastic place to start. If we could invite Jesus to our Easter services, that would be good. Well, especially perhaps he'd come back for Christmas and, and do all those Christingles. That would be wonderful. I mean, he'd be so much better than the speakers we've got. And, and he'd meet so many people. There's no way. He, he'd convince them. Of course he would. But Jesus says, no. Isn't that strange? It's better, he says, that I go. L look at verse 7 again. Because if I go, he says, I will send him. I will send the Spirit, that is, to be with you. Now, I think there's kind of two things here. When Jesus talks about uh, going or, or departing, returning to the Father, of course, he's talking about going to the cross. He, he returns to the Father through the suffering and the death of the cross for you and for me. So if he does not go, well, he will not be able to deal with sin and, and death and judgment that all that weigh against us. 
He will not be able to win that victory for us and then rise again, the, the conquering king ascending to the Father to give the Spirit to all who trust him. He will not be able to bring to us the fruits and spoils of that victory on the cross if he does not leave and go to the cross then we would not get to taste the forgiveness and the peace and the joy that he wins for us. And in a sense, that's an obvious thing to say. But there's another sense in which it is good that Jesus goes away. If Jesus had stayed with those first disciples in Jerusalem, well, around the year 30 AD or whatever year it was, not only would he have not gone to the cross for them and for us, but you and I would have been 2,000 years too late and in the wrong place to get to know him. History would have put us offside, if you like. We simply wouldn't have been there to get to know Jesus. But Jesus won the victory, returned to the Father and sent his spirit to be with the people of Jesus, his people, or rather, for the Spirit to be Jesus with his people, whenever and wherever they are, even with us in Hailsham in 2021. It was essential for those first disciples and for us that he returned to the Father so that the Spirit might come to bring the presence of Jesus to every disciple in every generation, in every place, for all time. It is good that he returns to the Father. But read on a little bit and dig a little bit deeper. Ask the question again, why is it better that Jesus is no longer with us but returned to the Father and the Spirit has come instead? Well, look at what Jesus says in verses 8 to 11. When the Spirit comes, he says, he will convict the world in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in him. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Now, all that sounds a little bit difficult, doesn't it? And you wonder, what is Jesus saying? Well, actually, it's very simple. The Spirit will come and will convict people, will convince them of their need for Jesus. He'll persuade people that they are lost and guilty and under God's judgment and need to be rescued. He will persuade them that God loves them so much that God has come to be their rescuer. And that's the key, isn't it? It's not just persuading people that somehow Jesus lived and, well, perhaps Jesus even died all those years ago, but that they need Jesus to rescue them. I mean, imagine the scene, if you will. Um, it's the beach in the summer. Yes, one day it will be summer and one day we'll be back on the beach. Down on the beach in the summer and there's a couple lying on the beach and they're sunbathing. Only the lifeguard has just got news of an impending tsunami. Obviously it isn't Eastbourne, they normally have tsunamis in Eastbourne. And the lifeguard rushes up to them and says, you're in danger, I've come to rescue you, you need to leave now. To which the couple respond, no of course we're not, we're enjoying our sunbathing. We're not drowning are we? We don't need a lifeguard. And of course that's the problem isn't it? Most people see no reason in the world why they might need rescuing. They think uh, life is okay, uh, they're fine, uh, make the most of it, uh, and one day, hopefully, uh, a long, long way off, uh, yes, we may die, of course we will, but there is no heaven, there is no hell, there is no God, there is no judgment. So what is there to worry about? But the Spirit comes to persuade that we need Jesus, just as Jesus did with the people that he met persuade people of their guilt because of sin, because they've not believed in Jesus, verse 9. Literally, he comes, says Jesus, to show people their sin, to expose the, 
uh, to the light of his truth. To see our sin for, well, for what it is. Our hearts for what they are really like. Loving ourselves, determined to go our own way, to live as if we're in charge, to live as this, as if this world is everything there is, to live as if God did not exist. And the Spirit will come to persuade the world that the world is guilty as charged. But in contrast, the Spirit will also convince the world of righteousness because of Jesus. Look at verse 10. He is going to the Father, and in contrast to our sin, the Spirit will convince us of Jesus' righteousness. The Spirit will convince us that he and he alone is the perfect, righteous rescuer that we need, who will rescue us through his death on the cross. He will convince us of our sin. He will convince us of Jesus' righteousness that he is the saviour we need, and that the Spirit will convince us of judgment. Look at verse 11. Because the prince of this world, that is Satan, stands condemned. He will convince us of, if you like, of Jesus' victory, that the power of sin and death and Satan over us has been broken forever. So while Satan stands condemned... There is pardon and there is forgiveness with Jesus. Do you see? Uh, the Spirit shows us the truth of who Jesus is, the truth of what Jesus has done, the truth of all we can now enjoy with Jesus. In other words, he shows, he persuades about Jesus. He, he, if you like, he shines the spotlight on Jesus. That's why the Spirit comes. Uh, so back to our infallible mission strategy, remember? Jesus on a portable pulpit in uh, Vicarage Field? Well, no. How many times would he be able to do that? How many Christing or services would he need to take over the next few years to reach all of the world with great good news? But here's the far, far better plan. Rather than Jesus uh, standing in Vicarage Field uh, one day, or indeed uh, leading our Christing or services, here's the much better plan. That everywhere, in every generation, the Spirit of God will be doing the work of Jesus, always, everywhere, forever, showing the world what we are like, and above all, what Jesus is like and what Jesus has done and why we need a rescuer. The Spirit comes so that people in every generation, in every place, will be able to see the light of Jesus shine upon him by the Spirit. But that still leaves a big question. How will the Holy Spirit do it. Have a look at verses 12 to 16. Jesus says, I've got much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Now, how will the Spirit fulfil this mission of shining light, illuminating Jesus and who Jesus is? Well, look at the answer uh, that Jesus gives. When the Spirit comes, verse 13, he will guide you, that is those first disciples, into all truth. Now, that's really interesting, isn't it? The Spirit comes to convince the world, but the Spirit is sent not to the world, but to those first disciples. The Spirit is given to one group of people, if you like, to the eleven plus Paul 
as the apostles of Jesus, witnesses of his resurrection. The Spirit is given first to them to do the work of Jesus for another group of people, the world. Uh, do you see what Jesus says in verses 7 and 8? The Spirit will come to you, verse 7, those first disciples, and he will convict them, that is the world. Do you see Jesus' strategy? The Spirit is given to the few, to those who belong to Jesus, to tell and to persuade those who do not. It's like ripples in a pond when a stone is thrown into mi in the middle. Slowly but inevitably, the ripple effect reaching out to every corner of the pond. From those first disciples of Jesus, given the Spirit to remind them of the words of Jesus, who now live for Jesus and speak for Jesus, and so others become disciples of Jesus, who will in turn make other disciples of Jesus. See, how will the Spirit do it? Verse 12, what does Jesus say to those disciples? The Spirit will guide you into all truth. He will speak only what he hears. He will take what is mine and he will make it known to you. He will take the words of Jesus. Words they cannot at this point bear, says Jesus, verse 12, to teach them, those first disciples, the truth that belongs to the Father and to the Son. The Spirit will teach them. In other words, the Spirit will teach their hearts the gospel, all that God has planned, all that God has done through Jesus, all that God will do now and when Jesus returns, taught by the Spirit to those first disciples who did what with what they were taught? Well, they wrote it down. That's our New Testament. The testimony, the, the witness of the apostles taught by the Spirit promised by Jesus, all the truth we need to announce to this world. Sometimes you hear, you know, you hear people say, well, of course, the gospel writers, they, they did their best. They were limited, though, weren't they? They were limited by their knowledge and by their culture. And of course, today we know so much more, don't we? We've moved on. Well, not according to Jesus. All truth given by Jesus through the Spirit to those first disciples. So how will the world hear of Jesus? How will be people persuaded? How will the people of Hailsham be persuaded? Through the Spirit who taught the words of Jesus to those first disciples, who in turn, empowered by the Spirit, proclaimed that message, written and spoken, to the world. It's what happened on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. The Spirit was given, and what happened? The apostles proclaimed the wonders of God. In particular, Peter stood up and preached a sermon to the crowd. It was actually a sermon from the Old Testament. The Spirit came and the gospel, spoken and then written, taught, shared, preached to the world. And people heard and people believed and they too received the Spirit and they too became disciples and in turn they taught and they shared and they preached good news to others. And so those ripples go out to the ends of the earth. Which is why, of course, we're, you know, the only church in the world isn't the one in Jerusalem. There are churches all over the world because of that ripple effect. There are disciples all over the world. In Bangalore, in Kampala, in Valencia, in Hailsham. Millions of witnesses. Witnesses carrying the same spirit-inspired message with them. The scriptures in the hands of every Christian. The words taught by the Spirit to those first disciples, which we now, enabled by the Spirit, carry to the world. See, that's God's strategy. That's God's strategy for Hailsham as we emerge from covid that's God's strategy for churches all over our town, not just for HPC. For hundreds of Christians in this town, enabled by the Spirit of God, sharing the Spirit-given gospel, written down in the pages of Scripture, and burnt into our hearts to persuade a town of its need of the Lord Jesus. That's his strategy. 
And that's why it's better that Jesus returned to the Father. It means we don't need to go to Jerusalem to find Jesus. We don't need to go to a special event, though it might be helpful. We don't need a, a special preacher or whatever it might be. We don't even need, well, it's good to have them, we don't even need a vicar or an associate vicar for that matter. All we need, what the world needs, is an army of Christians with the Holy Spirit as our helper to loudly and proudly and lovingly live and tell of Jesus. Sharing the good news, enabled by the Spirit, who will convince the world of its need of Jesus. That's what he calls us to do. That's what he'll be urging us to do afresh as we begin to emerge from COVID. So take great, great encouragement in the words of Jesus. He's given us a mission to be fruitful disciples in the world. But he hasn't left us on our own to do it. He sent his Holy Spirit to be alongside us, the Spirit of Truth, who through the words he taught to those first disciples in the scriptures now enables us to be his servants, his missioners today. So be encouraged. Let me pray. Father God, thank you so much for the words of Jesus. Please help us as we reflect on them in our house groups. But more than that, may they inspire us to be sharers of good news, knowing that as we speak that good news of the apostles, those witnesses of the resurrection, as we preach the good news they proclaimed, as we share it, as we speak it with our neighbours, with those in our family, those in our community, as we share that good news, so the, the Holy Spirit will shine his light on the Lord Jesus and so persuade a needy world. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much for listening. Do uh, enjoy uh, your time in house groups.